January 30th, 1925, a 37-year-old man named Floyd Collins walked through this huge forest in central Kentucky inside of a national park. As he walked along, his boots splashed in the melting snow and mud on the ground, and above him, all he heard was the sound of water dripping down amongst the leaves. It was warmer than it had been in several days, and so that was why Floyd was out here. He was trying to take advantage of the nice weather. And so after walking for a while on this muddy, slushy trail, the trees around Floyd began to thin out, and then eventually he reached the edge of the tree line, and in front of him was this huge clearing. Now, in this clearing, the trail he was on continued straight ahead, but it came to a stop in front of this huge cavern-like opening in the side of a hill. And so without hesitation, Floyd stepped out of the trees into the sunlight and he walked the rest of the trail right up to the opening of this cavern and he stopped and just stared and smiled. This cavern-like space on the side of this hill was the entrance to a cave known as Sand Cave. And Floyd had spent the last week coming out to Sand Cave and exploring the different tunnels, but today his plan was to go as deep and as far inside of this cave as he possibly could. Caves were a huge tourist attraction in this region, and Floyd was a very experienced caver who had been caving since he was six years old, and he knew that most of Sand Cave had not been explored. And so if he could go in there and explore all the different parts of the cave and map it all out and make sure it was safe, it was sure to be a huge moneymaker. He could bring people here and lead them on guided tours. So Floyd left the muddy path he had been walking on and stepped foot inside of this grand entrance to Sand Cave. It's basically this 250 foot wide cathedral-like space inside of this hill with ceilings high enough you could stand but it's totally dark in there. And despite being this big open space, it very quickly funnels to this one kind of tunnel that goes straight down and connects to all these offshoot underground passageways, many of which have never been explored before. And so as Floyd walked across this big open entryway, he lit his oil lamp and then began mentally preparing himself for what he was about to do, which was going to be very claustrophobia inducing, even for a very experienced caver. And so Floyd reached the back of this huge entryway and he reached this tunnel that would connect to the rest of the cave and he began walking down it. And this tunnel was not very restricting. You could stand in it, you could move around in it, but it was very short. It was 15 feet straight down at an angle where at the bottom of those 15 feet was a square hole in the ground. And Floyd, having been here the previous week, knew that once you go through this hole, the real caving begins. Now you're gonna be down on your hands and knees, wriggling your way through these very tight and restricting areas where you don't really know where you're going. Because again, a lot of this stuff has never been explored before. But this is why Floyd loved caving. He loved the adventure and the risk of doing things like this. And so Floyd got to this hole, he put his oil lamp down on the ground, he casually lowered himself feet first into this hole, which dropped down several feet. And then once he was on firm ground, he reached up, grabbed his oil lamp and pulled it into the hole with him. Once he was inside of this lower level space, he crouched down and looked around and off to his right was a tunnel that he could crawl through that seemed to lead to a series of other tunnels. And so he puts his lamp in front of him, he gets down and he begins crawling through this tunnel. And after a little while, he reaches this kind of fork in the road where he had several options of very narrow tunnels to choose from. Now, the previous week, Floyd had gone down several of these tunnels and mapped out where they went, but there was one tunnel in particular at this fork that was very narrow. It was likely the most narrow of all the tunnels, but from where he had seen the last week, it looked like it went pretty far without obstruction. And so he immediately began going head first into this tunnel where he had no idea where it was gonna go. Think about that. If you go head first into a tunnel and you get stuck, what are you gonna do? You can't really go anywhere. So this guy is like totally fearless, just going head first into what most people would consider a nightmare scenario. And so the way Floyd would approach these very tight tunnels is he would put his oil lamp out in front of him and then he'd keep his hands over his head and he'd kind of wriggle his way head first and push his lamp along the way. And so that's what he did. He began going into this really restrictive tunnel. You know, it's hard to breathe because the walls are so tight on his chest cavity. But as he's going, eventually the ceiling begins to slope upward just enough that he can pull himself up onto his hands and knees and kind of catch his breath. 
By this point, Floyd was approximately 55 feet underground. That's where this little pocket was where he could get up on his hands and knees and breathe. And so from this position, he still could see with his lamp that this tunnel continued to snake further and further down. And his hope was that eventually it would lead to a big underground chamber that was not just big enough to go to your hands and knees on, but was big enough you could stand and walk around in because those were the big tourist attractions. Not only because it seems like another world underground that you can fully explore and walk around in, but also, as Floyd knew from his past experience of going into other caves, a lot of times those big underground chambers are full of Native American artifacts. And again, that was a huge potential moneymaker for people like Floyd because it allowed him to advertise that this cave where tourists could go explore was full of all this rich history. And so Floyd eventually, after catching his breath in this little spot, got back down onto his stomach with his hands out in front of him with the lamp out ahead of his fingers and he began going deeper and deeper into this unexplored section of sand cave and as he inched along even though the ceiling remained very tight on top of him he's totally compressed to the ground the walls on either side of him began to expand which meant floyd if he wanted to could actually turn himself around although he couldn't stand up and so floyd is making his way down this very low ceiling area when he notices his oil lamp is beginning to flicker, which means it's going to go out soon. Now, Floyd wasn't concerned about suddenly being in the darkness inside of a cave. Now, to most people, that would be terrifying, but Floyd, again, was so experienced, he was very confident that he could easily make his way out again just by touch. He didn't need the light. But he did know that trying to move around inside of a cave in the darkness was dangerous, and so he should not do that if he could avoid it. And so as much as Floyd wanted to continue and hopefully find something incredible inside of this cave, he decided he really needed to just turn around and go back to the surface and come back the next day to continue exploring. And so because this part of the tunnel he was in was really wide, he was able to turn himself around and drag his lamp until he was facing back uphill and then he rolled onto his back. So his head is pointing back up where he came from and his feet are pointing in the direction that he had previously been traveling and he's on his back. And so his oil lamp is above his head. He can move his arms side to side because again, it's pretty wide in the area he's in, but his head is pretty restricted by the ceiling and he began inching with his heels and pushing with his arms, moving up the tunnel on his back. And as he would move, he'd use his head and his hands to push the oil lamp back up the direction he was going. And for a little while, this system worked great. But at some point, right as he was getting close to that area where he was able to previously get on his hands and knees and catch his breath, Floyd accidentally kind of rushed and pushed his lamp too hard and knocked it over, which extinguished the light. And so suddenly, Floyd was cast into total darkness. Now, again, Floyd was not concerned or really even scared about being in darkness inside of this cave, but this was not a good scenario and he knew it. But he told himself, stay calm. He knew where he was in the cave. He just needed to get to that little pocket. He'd catch his breath and then he'd continue his way back up, eventually reach that hole in the ceiling, that square hole. He'd climb out, make his way out of the cave and boom, he'd be done. And so Floyd just continued to push the now extinguished oil lamp above his head. And he continued to inch with his heels and moved his arms around to keep going backwards up this tunnel. But then right before Floyd reached that pocket inside of the tunnel where he could get onto his hands and knees, he heard the sound of falling rocks somewhere below him, kind of near his legs. Now it's pitch black, he can't see anything. And so Floyd just kind of held his breath and hoped that whatever was happening wouldn't affect him but then he felt a shooting pain in his left leg. A 27 pound rock had broken loose from the low ceiling and landed on his left ankle. Now at first, Floyd was actually relieved that the rock had landed only on his left leg. And in fact, his leg was actually kind of positioned in a depression on the floor of the cave. And so the rock didn't really hit his left ankle directly. It kind of like hit the ground and then leaned onto his left ankle. And his left ankle was kind of protected in the depression in the cave floor. And so Floyd's thinking, thank goodness, it only landed on my ankle and not on my head or my chest because then I'd be dead. And so after catching his breath and kind of calming down, Floyd tensed his body and pulled his left leg as hard as he could to clear this 27 pound rock. 
but his foot wouldn't budge. And so Floyd thought he would just reach down and kind of dig his foot out. He'd just move the rock out of the way. But even though this cave had widened out on either side of Floyd when he had gone deeper and deeper into it, because he had retraced his steps, he was farther up the tunnel where those sides had really come in much closer to him. And so he wasn't able to actually reach down and touch the rock. The walls made it impossible. And so he wasn't able to use his hands to clear this rock. And so Floyd is pinned underground, unable to move, in absolute pitch darkness inside of a cave that's practically crushing his chest because the ceiling is so low and he knows it's unstable. The ceiling has now fallen off, so there's a chance more rocks could come in at any time. I mean, this is like a worst case scenario for anybody who goes caving. But Floyd told himself to just stay calm. He knew this was a very bad situation, but people were certain to find out he was missing and they knew he had gone to Sand Cave and they would come here, they would find him and they would rescue him. And so Floyd just decided he would wait. And for an agonizing 30 hours, remember, 30 hours of pitch blackness trapped in a totally claustrophobic environment, 30 hours of this, no food, no water, can't go to the bathroom. He's laying there for 30 hours and then finally he hears a voice coming from somewhere near the entrance of this cave. And when he heard that voice, it was like the sweetest sound he had ever heard. Because not only did they represent help, but the voice was coming from Floyd's brother, Homer, who was also a very experienced caver. And so Floyd's thinking, thank goodness, I'm saved. And so Homer was able to navigate from the entrance down all the way to the tunnel that Floyd was in. And Homer got to that spot in the tunnel where Floyd had gone to his hands and knees, that pocket there. So Homer's in that pocket and he can see Floyd is only a few feet away from him. He can see Floyd's head right there. And so Homer, who had a lamp, you know, he shines the light on Floyd and the two brothers don't waste any time with small talk. Instead, Homer, who had his oil lamp, had set it up right next to them and he began feeding Floyd sausage sandwiches and giving him sips of water. And then Homer would tell Floyd that he just did not have the equipment to help Floyd get out right now, but Homer was going to go back to the surface, get men, get supplies, and then come back and save Floyd. And so Floyd is very thankful, he's very relieved. He says goodbye to Homer, and Homer turns and makes his way back up to the surface. 15 hours later, Homer would return by himself. And so at this point, Floyd has been trapped for 45 hours. And so Floyd, he's laying there kind of in and out of consciousness, and he hears the sound of Homer calling out to him. And then he hears the sound of Homer chiseling away at some rocks. It would turn out Homer's plan to save Floyd was basically to chisel away the side of this section of tunnel that Floyd was stuck in, in order to be able to reach down and somehow, some way, clear the rock off of Floyd's leg and then pull Floyd up. Now, Floyd understood, of course, that this plan of chiseling away the side of this tunnel to make it wider was going to take some time, but luckily Homer had shown up with more food and water and they chatted the whole time as Homer worked. And so Floyd was in good spirits and Homer was very optimistic. But after eight hours of Homer slowly chiseling his way, widening this tunnel, he hadn't made much progress and he was totally exhausted. I mean, you gotta remember that the angle he was working at was horrible. He was basically crouched down on his hands and knees, chipping away at this rock. And so after those eight hours, Homer would leave Floyd and go back home and sleep and eat and drink and kind of recover. But he told Floyd, don't worry, tomorrow more men will be here to help chisel away this tunnel and get Floyd out of there. But over the course of the next 50 hours, Floyd remained trapped inside of this tunnel with the rock pinning his leg. And despite Homer and several other men getting down there and very diligently chipping away at this tunnel, it just was not happening very quickly. And so over the course of those 50 hours, Floyd began going in and out of consciousness and he began not being able to differentiate between what was real and what was not. 
At one point, he would say that he believed the cave had kind of opened up and these angels riding golden chariots with flaming wheels had come in to save him. And as they were lifting him out of the cave, he smelled food and coffee. And then suddenly his hallucination cleared and he realized he was trapped in the darkness all alone, still in this cave. And it was like it destroyed his morale. And so Floyd is really starting to go downhill and the rescuers are realizing they need to do something and they need to do something now. But at the 130 hour mark, things got even worse for Floyd. As he was laying there in the tunnel, this was sometime in the middle of the night, and so no rescuers were actively down there trying to chisel their way down to him. He was laying there and he was listening to the sound of the running water somewhere outside the cave, and that sound was kind of amplified down to him. And then all of a sudden, he heard the sound of falling rocks somewhere up above. And then when those rocks stopped and it went silent again, he could not hear the sound of the running water. It was very muffled. And that was when he realized that there must have been a cave in somewhere higher up in the cave, which meant potentially there could be a significant block just to get down to him. Forget about widening this tunnel. I mean, he could be actually entombed inside of Sand Cave. And so Floyd did the only thing he could do which was to pray. It would turn out that cave-in had indeed blocked the way for rescuers to get down to Floyd. And because of how extensive this cave-in was, the rescuers actually decided to start carving a brand new tunnel that would join up with the side of Floyd's tunnel. I mean, this is an even bigger undertaking than just chiseling the side of the tunnel that Floyd was in, which was their original plan and had taken several days. And so now they have to build this brand new tunnel to Floyd. And so finally, on February 16th, 1925, so a staggering 17 days from the time Floyd got first stuck in this cave, the rescue team finally punched through and reached Floyd. And as soon as they did, the lead rescuer looked over at Floyd and then he paused, he turned up and he just said, dead. It would turn out shortly after that cave in, which sealed Floyd in completely inside of Sand Cave, at some point over the next couple of days, those rocks began to break free and tumble down the cave and began striking Floyd until finally one or several of those rocks hit him in the head or chest and killed him. So just imagine you are trapped. You've been there for several days. You're in total darkness. You're entombed inside of this cave and periodically rocks just come tumbling down and smash into you. Who knows how long it took to kill him, but that has to be one of the most agonizing ways to go ever. Shortly before that cave-in first happened, a photographer took a picture of Floyd, who at the time believed he was going to get out, and all the rescuers believed they were going to get him out. But shortly after this photo was taken, the cave-in would happen, and at that point, Floyd didn't know it, but he was doomed. Here is that photo. Floyd's body was eventually removed from Sand Cave. However, instead of being buried, because of the interest around this cave rescue that ultimately failed, there was a decision made to actually put Floyd's body on display inside of another cave. Basically, Floyd's body became a tourist attraction. And it would remain a tourist attraction for decades until finally he was removed from that cave and given a proper burial. 3rd, 1897, a blacksmith named Erasmus Shue stoked his fire inside of his little shop in rural West Virginia and then called out to his 11-year-old helper who was in the back cleaning up. Erasmus had been planning to head home early that night. However, a last-minute order for horseshoes had just come in, and so Erasmus knew that was not going to happen. He was going to have to work late. And so he was calling for his helper to send the helper to his home, Erasmus's home, to check on Erasmus his wife, Zona. He wanted to make sure that one, Zona knew he would be late, and two, if Zona needed anything, the helper could go out and get it for her or help around the house or whatever she needed. After the helper had left, Erasmus went back to poking at his fire, but his mind was not on the horseshoes he needed to make. Instead, it was on his wife, Zona. The couple hadn't told anyone yet, but Zona was pregnant. Erasmus and Zona had only just met a couple of months earlier, but they had fallen in love very quickly. 
Zona was 23 years old and she had beautiful dark hair and dark eyes and a quick sense of humor. She was a total free spirit who had grown up on a farm and she had never really been away from home. When Erasmus had arrived in the little village called Livesay's Mill, which was located near a river at the foot of this mountain and was right near where Zona lived, he and Zona had noticed each other right away. Erasmus, who was quite a bit older than Zona, he was 35 years old, was tall and handsome with piercing blue eyes, and he had come to this little rural town to set up his blacksmith shop. And to Zona, he was like this amazing, new, exciting thing. Zona's family, especially her mother, Mary Jane, did not approve of the fact that Zona and Erasmus had begun seeing each other, mostly because Mary Jane didn't like the fact that Erasmus was so much older than Zona, but Zona was known for being incredibly stubborn, and she loved Erasmus, and so there was just no stopping her. So, in November, just a couple of months after meeting each other, Zona and Erasmus got married and they moved into a little house together and very quickly, Zona got pregnant. And both she and Erasmus were so excited about this that they wanted to go around and tell people, but early on, it was clear Zona had some complications with this pregnancy. She was sick all the time and she just seemed really unwell and the doctor who was seeing her knew that it likely had to do with her pregnancy. And so the couple decided decided that they should just wait and let the pregnancy develop a bit before announcing the news. So on this late January day, Erasmus began hustling to finish these horseshoes because he really wanted to get home and be there for Zona and make sure she really was okay. And so as Erasmus thought about Zona, the steel he was heating inside of this fire was glowing bright orange and was ready to be forged into shape. And so Erasmus got his hammer and he got to work. Meanwhile, Erasmus's 11-year-old helper had arrived at Erasmus and Zona's house, and the helper walked through the gate up to the front door of this little two-story home, and he knocked on the front door. But Zona did not come to the door, which the helper thought was odd, because Zona was someone who was always bustling around the home and was very quick to open the door and chat with neighbors. And now, standing in front of this door, the helper couldn't even hear a sound inside of the house. It was like no one was home. And so the helper knocked again, and after some more silence, he just reached down and tried the doorknob and found it was unlocked, and so he swung the door in. And right away, the helper noticed that the house was totally dark. None of the lamps were lit, even though the sun was setting fast. And so the helper stepped inside of the house and continued to call out for Mrs. Shu, but there was no answer. And at some point, as the helper turned a corner and looked towards the base of the stairs that led up to the second level, he froze because lying on the ground was Zona. She was lying perpendicular to how the stairs run on her back with one arm over her chest like she was sleeping at the foot of the stairs. And so at this point, the helper is scared. He doesn't know what's going on here. Obviously something is wrong. And so very slowly, the helper began moving closer and closer to Zona. And when he was practically right on top of her, he yelled out her name one more time. And when she didn't call back and her chest wasn't moving and she was just totally still, he knew obviously something was terribly wrong. And so the helper at this point turned around and sprinted out of the house and ran back to his own house. And when he got there, he ran inside and he told his mother that he thought Mrs. Shu, Zona, was dead. And so the mother told the helper, run back to the blacksmith shop and tell Erasmus to go home right now, I'll get the doctor. It would take the local doctor, the same one who had been treating Zona for her pregnancy complications, almost an hour to finally get to Zona's house. And when the doctor arrived, he found the 11-year-old helper and his mother and other neighbors kind of clustered around in the first floor of the home. And then when he went up to the second floor into the master bedroom, he found Erasmus, who by this point had returned, and he was sitting on his bed and he had laid out his wife, Zona, so that she was on her back and her head was in his arm arms and he was stroking her hair and rocking back and forth and crying. The doctor, of course, knew Zona and Erasmus very well because of how often he had been treating Zona for her pregnancy issues over these last few weeks. And so he felt a pit of sadness looking at the scene, but he knew he had to do his job. And so he gently walked over and he put his hand on Erasmus's shoulder and he just said, you know, I need to examine Zona's body. And Erasmus at this point, he didn't even look up. He just continued to sob and rock back and forth while stroking her hair. 
Finally, the doctor kind of was a bit more forceful in asking Erasmus to step aside, at which point Erasmus did, he got out of the way, and positioned Zona flat on the bed, and he made sure her hair was perfectly combed all around her neck, and then Erasmus knelt down right next to the bed and continued stroking his wife's hair and crying, while the doctor at this point kind of moved to the foot of the bed and began looking at Zona and beginning his examination. And the doctor would quickly confirm that yes, Zona was dead. And after looking at her pelvis and kind of moving her around, the doctor came to the conclusion that very likely Zona had passed away from pregnancy complications. Zona's funeral would be held the next day at the local cemetery at the top of this hilltop. And by this point, the word had gotten out that Zona had been pregnant when she died. And so during this funeral, everybody was staring at Erasmus who was overcome with grief and crying so hard that he could barely catch his breath. And then right before they lowered Zona's casket into the ground, Erasmus made a point of putting his wife's favorite scarf into the coffin with her. He said his final goodbyes, he shut the casket, and then it was lowered into the ground. But while the mourners were obviously very moved by just how unbelievably grief-stricken Erasmus was, I mean, his whole family was wiped out in one blow, what really stood out to the people that attended that funeral was not Erasmus's reaction to his wife's death, but rather Zona's mother's reaction to Erasmus. During this funeral, Mary Jane, Zona's mother, didn't seem sad or grief-stricken or in any way reacting to the fact that her daughter had died. Instead, as the funeral went on, Mary Jane shamelessly glared at Erasmus with a look of pure hate and disgust on her face. And then, after the funeral was over, all the mourners wanted to go up to Mary Jane and Erasmus to pay their final respects to the family, but Mary Jane ignored all these people and promptly left the funeral without saying a word to anyone. And in the days that followed Zona's funeral, Mary Jane's behavior only continued to get more and more bizarre. When neighbors would drop by Mary Jane's house to drop off food or just check in on her, Mary Jane refused to come to the door. Mary Jane basically began staying up all night. People would see there were candles lit in her bedroom at all hours, and they'd see her pacing around her room and then periodically kneeling on the ground and kind of staring off into the distance. And then on the rare occasion that Mary Jane actually left her house, she would look totally disheveled and distracted. And as she walked around town, she'd be mumbling under her breath and constantly looking over her shoulder like she was scared someone was following her. And when concerned neighbors came up to Mary when she was out of her house, she refused to make eye contact with them, didn't want to talk to them, and as fast as she could would get away from them. Whatever was going on with Mary Jane, her husband was not willing to talk about it to other people in town. However, they did notice that he had begun sleeping in the barn, so he was not even staying in the house with his wife. And then on the morning of February 21st, so about a month after Zona had died, Mary Jane walked out of her house looking totally clean cut. She was not disheveled. She was not looking over her shoulder. She wasn't muttering to herself. She was standing tall, moving with a purpose, looking totally coherent. And as she moved, the only emotion people could see on her face was anger. And so Mary Jane, angrily walking with a purpose, walked her way to the local prosecutor's office and instead of knocking and waiting to be let inside she just opened the door and barged right inside the prosecutor knew mary jane and knew how strange she had been acting over these last few weeks and so when she came inside he was alarmed at her sudden presence but he was also pretty curious as to what was going on and so when she came in and demanded to speak to him he was happy to go into his office and take a meeting kind of simply out of curiosity. But once the two of them sat down in his office, Mary Jane proceeded to tell this prosecutor this totally outlandish story about her dead daughter, Zona, that at first made the prosecutor think, okay, clearly Mary Jane has lost her mind. That's what's been going on over the past few weeks. All this grief of losing her daughter has caused her to kind of snap. But by the end of these two hours that Mary Jane seemed to just be kind of rambling about this story about her daughter, the prosecutor started to realize that 
what she was saying kind of made a lot of sense and his suspicions began to rise and rise. And so once Mary Jane was done telling this wild story about Zona, the prosecutor was convinced that what Mary Jane was saying had to be true. And so he knew they needed to dig Zona up. And so after Mary Jane had left, the prosecutor ran to the local doctor's house, the same doctor who had been treating Zona and then also looked at her after she died. And the prosecutor would tell the doctor that, hey, we need to exhume Zona and you need to examine her again. And the doctor at first was like, wait a minute, what's going on here? But then after hearing what the prosecutor had to say about this crazy story that Mary Jane had just told him, the doctor agreed that, okay, yeah, we do need to do this. And so the next day, February 22nd, a team of men with shovels, along with the prosecutor and the doctor, headed up to the hilltop cemetery where Zona was buried, and they dug her casket up, and then they carried the casket down to the local schoolhouse, and then once she was inside, the workers lifted her body, which was fairly well preserved because the ground was so cold. They lifted her body out and they placed it on a table, and then everybody left except for the doctor and the prosecutor. And once the room was clear, the doctor and the prosecutor began examining Zona all over again. And within about 30 seconds of this re-examination of Zona's body, basically at the exact same time, the doctor and the prosecutor, who were on either sides of the body, saw the thing that Mary Jane had alluded to in her wild story about her daughter. And so the doctor and the prosecutor, they're seeing this thing, they look up at each other and they can't believe it. Mary Jane's story had to be true. The following is Mary Jane's wild story. On the day of Zona's funeral, even though Mary Jane was overcome with grief over losing her daughter, the feeling that she really was harboring was hatred towards Erasmus. She hated Erasmus, she had always hated him, but now it was like her daughter is dead and she's forced to watch this guy sob and cry over her daughter's casket, when in her mind she's like, this funeral is about her, it's not about you. And so the whole funeral, she's just staring at Erasmus, channeling all of her energy towards hating him. But then as she's doing this, a new emotion began to creep up on her that she couldn't quite describe. Basically, it felt like something was terribly wrong. And intuitively, Mary Jane felt like the only person who could explain what this thing was that was wrong kind of in her life somewhere was her daughter, Zona, who was obviously dead. And so this feeling that something is terribly wrong, it completely consumed Mary Jane's mind. And so by the end of the funeral, she wasn't mad at Erasmus. She was just thinking, how do I get in touch with my daughter? I need to get answers from my daughter. And so when the funeral ended, Mary Jane just left the funeral as fast as she could. She went home, she went into her bedroom and she knelt down and she began to pray. Not for peace or strength in this difficult time, but instead, she prayed for her daughter's ghost to appear to her and tell her what was wrong. And for the next month, that is all Mary Jane did. She was obsessed with this idea that she needed to basically conjure her daughter's ghost to tell her what this thing was that was wrong. And so that was why she was acting totally crazy. All she did was pray and then look for signs that her daughter's ghost had come or was on her way. And so she'd be up all night kind of looking around, hoping her daughter would suddenly appear. And then when she would go outside, the reason she was muttering is because she was still praying under her breath and she was always looking over her shoulders because she thought her daughter would appear any moment. And then finally, one night in the middle of February, so this is a month into Mary Jane's attempts to conjure her daughter's ghost. She was in her room. She was praying like she normally did with all of her candles lit. And all of a sudden, as she's kneeling down praying, this bright light appears in the middle of her room. And as this light suddenly appeared, the room began to get really cold. And Mary Jane is staring at this light thinking, this is my daughter. But then just as quickly as the light and the cold that came with it had appeared, it disappeared. And so Mary Jane was both really excited because she felt like, okay, the prayers are working. That had to be my daughter's ghost or some sign that my daughter's ghost is going to come here. And so Mary Jane just doubled down on her prayers. She knew she was close to getting her daughter to show up. And so over the next two days, that bright light would appear two more times, and each time it would just quickly disappear. But again, Mary Jane is thinking, okay, something's happening, my prayers are working. And then finally, on the fourth night, as Mary Jane is in her bedroom praying, 
the light appears in the middle of her room. It starts to get cold. But then instead of the light disappearing, Mary Jane would describe seeing her daughter kind of step out of this light and suddenly appear in the room. Mary Jane said that her daughter was dressed all in black and her skin was very pale and her eyes were these dark pits and her hair was straight down right over her shoulders and she was staring at her mother and Mary Jane when she saw this even though she had been trying for a month to get her daughter's ghost to appear now that it seemed to be happening she was terrified and so Mary Jane began backing up right as this ghost begins walking towards Mary Jane but then Mary Jane as she's up against the wall tells herself you have to be strong you need to talk to the ghost you need to figure out what's wrong and the only question that Mary Jane was able to come up with was how did you die? And when she asked this question, Zona's ghost came to a stop. And then when Zona opened her mouth, dirt poured out. And then with a raspy, low voice, she began to tell her mother a story. She told her that Erasmus appeared to be this wonderful person to the community, but behind closed doors, he was a monster. He hit her and screamed at her over the littlest things. And then on the night of January 22nd, so one day before Zona would be discovered at the base of the stairs by Erasmus's helper, Zona's ghost would tell Mary Jane that Erasmus had become enraged at Zona over the food she had made that night for dinner. He had wanted meat and she had made something else. And so he was furious. And when Zona tried to tell Erasmus that she would make more food or there was other food for him to eat to just please calm down, Erasmus stood up and he grabbed Zona by the neck and he lifted her off the ground. And right at this moment in this story that Zona's ghost is telling Mary Jane, the ghost would stop speaking. And this look of abject terror would come across the ghost's face as if she was suddenly reliving this moment that happened with Erasmus. And as she's standing there with this horrible look on her face, the ghost began to levitate off the ground and then it opened its mouth. And as it did, no sound came out, but instead it was like all all the air in the room was getting sucked into this ghost's open mouth. And then all of a sudden, there was this loud cracking sound as the ghost's head suddenly violently whipped around 180 degrees, but the ghost's body was still facing towards Mary Jane. And after this happened, Mary Jane is sitting there totally dumbstruck, and the ghost suddenly drops back down onto the ground, still with their chest facing Mary Jane, but their face pointing behind them. And then Zona's ghost turned around and began walking out of the room, and because she had turned her body around, that meant her head, which was facing the wrong way, was now oriented towards Mary Jane again, and Mary Jane would say the ghost was smiling, and then right before Zona's ghost left, she would say to her mother, now do you see what he did to me? And then Zona just vanished and the room became warm again. And Mary Jane, who was suddenly feeling so exhausted, just sat down on the bed and wept. Mary Jane had the next morning promptly gotten up and rushed to the prosecutor's office and told him the story of seeing her daughter's ghost and how the ghost had told her that Erasmus had throttled her and that was what killed her. Now the prosecutor was really moved by Mary Jane's story, but it was when he rushed to the doctor to ask about re-examining Zona's body to see if she had marks on her neck from where she could have been throttled. That was when the doctor actually told the prosecutor that when he did the examination of Zona's body on the day she was found, he would say that Erasmus spent the entire examination at the head of the bed, cradling Zona's head and brushing her hair. But now that he was thinking about it, he could have been covering up her neck with the hair. And then also they thought about the funeral when right before Zona was lowered into the ground, Erasmus placed a scarf claiming it was his wife's favorite around her neck when she was buried. Again, perhaps trying to conceal the fact that there were marks on her neck. And when they did exhume Zona's body and they removed that scarf that Erasmus had placed, they would see there were marks all over her neck that looked like fingerprints. And then upon further examination, they would see that her neck was actually dislocated and that her windpipe had been crushed. Erasmus would be arrested for the murder of his wife just minutes after the doctor and prosecutor basically at the same time saw the marks on Zona's neck during their re-examination. During Erasmus's trial, Mary Jane would take the stand and she would tell the story of her daughter's ghost coming to her and explaining that Erasmus had killed her. And the testimony was so compelling that the jury found Erasmus guilty, even though there was no motive. Basically, they convicted him on the strength of Mary Jane's ghost story.
Erasmus would be sentenced to life in prison, but he would die just three years after being incarcerated from a mystery illness that passed through the prison. It would also turn out that Erasmus had been married two times before marrying Zona. One of his wives had divorced him for being abusive. The other wife died in a freak accident when she was helping Erasmus fix their chimney when all of a sudden a brick fell loose and hit her in the head. Today, there is a plaque right near the cemetery in West Virginia where Zona was buried that reads in part, only known case in which testimony from a ghost helped convict a murderer. At around five o'clock in the evening on June 25th, 1999, a man named Ricky McCormick stumbled into an emergency room in St. Louis, Missouri, with his hand over his chest, complaining that he couldn't breathe. He said he had asthma, and earlier that day he had been cutting the grass, and so maybe that had caused a flare up. But either way, here he was in a lot of discomfort saying, you know, I need help. Ricky was 41 years old, and for his whole life, he had had heart and lung problems. And so him arriving in this state in the ER was actually not all that uncommon for him. And so this hospital did what they did with anyone who came in complaining that they couldn't breathe. They immediately took Ricky to a back exam room and they hooked him up to all these monitors to make sure his heartbeat was steady and that his oxygen levels were plenty high. And once Ricky was in the exam room getting hooked up, he started acting really agitated and he kept looking around the room like he was scared that someone was gonna jump out at him. And he was also sweating profusely. And whenever he did speak, he spoke so quickly, no one could really understand him. But despite Ricky's odd behavior, the heart monitor showed his heart was beating steadily, his oxygen levels were perfectly fine, and when the doctor came in and examined Ricky, even though he clearly saw that something was off about Ricky, there wasn't any sign that there was anything physically wrong with Ricky. And so the doctor and the nurses agreed that whatever was going on with Ricky had to be psychological. And as it happened, Ricky did have a long history of psychological issues. He was known for making things up all the time, just telling people these crazy stories about himself, like how he was this talented singer and he was about to go on tour, or that he was actually a prince, or that he was studying to be a doctor. I mean, things that nobody thought was true, but Ricky would say as if this is just common knowledge, this is who I am. And so Ricky's family for the longest time had just assumed that Ricky was either bipolar or maybe schizophrenic. Those are both serious mental health disorders that totally disrupt normal thinking. But Ricky, despite being encouraged by his friends and family to go get help, never got help for any of his psychological issues. And so Ricky's life had kind of gone off the rails. He had dropped out of high school and not gone back to any sort of schooling, and he had spent some time in jail. Now, Ricky was living in a low income, very dangerous part of St. Louis, which is a big Midwestern city on the Mississippi River that in 1999 had a very serious issue with gang violence. Ricky absolutely hated it there, but he had no way to actually leave St. Louis. In fact, Ricky didn't even have his own place. He bounced around from his mother's place, his aunt's place, and his girlfriend's place. Ricky did work, but the work was very sporadic and it was for the most part just night shifts for random odd jobs. And when Ricky was actually working, he really just spent his time chain smoking cigarettes and drinking literally gallons of coffee. Back at the ER, Ricky, who was still in the exam room, had only been there for less than an hour when the doctor came back in and told Ricky that he was okay and he was going to be discharged. Now, Ricky immediately said, no, no, I have to be here tonight. I need to stay here. You need to admit me. But the doctor just kind of ignored what he said and handed him the discharge paperwork. 15 minutes later, when a nurse came back into the exam room to get this paperwork from Ricky, she would walk in and see Ricky still sitting on the exam bed, kind of fidgeting around, looking down at this paperwork on his lap that immediately she saw he had not filled out. He had just signed his name at the bottom. And when she walked in, Ricky looked up at her and he kind of shrugged his shoulders and looked at her and was like, I don't know how to read or write, can you help me? And so the nurse immediately felt bad for Ricky. I mean, he's got dirty clothes on, he looks thin and frail, he's clearly very down on his luck, there's some issues happening with this guy, and he can't even fill out his discharge paperwork. And so she said, no problem. She sat down with him and together they filled out his paperwork. And then afterwards, when she walked him out of the exam room back to the front of the hospital, 
Ricky turned to her and said, you know, instead of going home, can you just let me stay here in the lobby just for tonight? And this nurse, who knew she was not allowed to do this, she looked around and saw it was not a busy night there. And so she said, okay, as long as you don't bother anyone, you can stay here. And so Ricky thanked her repeatedly and then walked over to the corner, kind of far away from the front desk and far away from the front door. And he sat down and folded his arms and then he just stared at the front door. And so this nurse assumed that Ricky actually must be homeless, especially based on, you know, how he came in and how he was acting. And so she figured, you know, he needs a place that's warm to stay tonight. And so the nurse went back to her station and over the course of the next several hours, she would periodically look out into the lobby, expecting to see Ricky kind of curled up asleep in the corner. But every time she looked out there, Ricky was still sitting upright, arms folded, staring at the front door of the hospital as if he was expecting someone to come in at any moment and he needed to be ready. And so she thought this was unusual, but she decided not to intervene. She just let him sit there and do his thing. Later that morning at 11.30 a.m., when the nice nurse who had allowed Ricky to stay in the lobby was leaving her shift, another crew of nurses came in and right away they noticed Ricky was just sitting in the corner for no apparent reason. And when they walked up to him to ask if he was okay, you know, what are you doing here? What can we do for you? Ricky, instead of trying to talk to any of these nurses, just got up and walked out of the hospital. After leaving the hospital, Ricky walked to a nearby payphone and he called his girlfriend, Sandy. And when Sandy picked up the phone, she immediately recognized her boyfriend's very familiar voice, but she also picked up that he sounded really tired and kind of out of it. And so when she asked him, you know, are you okay? What's going on? Ricky would tell her that he had just spent the night in the hospital, but he didn't clarify that he had spent the night in the lobby of the hospital, not admitted as a patient at the hospital. But to Sandy, it really didn't matter because already this was raising red flags for her because this was actually the second time that Ricky had gone to the ER just that week. Just a few days earlier, Ricky had been released from a different hospital in St. Louis after telling doctors there that he had had these chest pains and he couldn't breathe. And so he had been admitted for a couple of days, but ultimately they determined that there really was nothing wrong with him. And they too believed whatever was happening with him had to be psychological. And so he had been released. Additionally, Sandy had been growing increasingly worried about Ricky because over the last several weeks, Ricky had begun acting really paranoid to the point where anytime he was in her apartment and somebody outside the apartment just walked down the hallway, Ricky would jump as if he was worried whoever was out there was going to barge in at any moment. But whenever Sandy asked Ricky, you know, what's going on? Why are you so paranoid? He refused to elaborate. So feeling very concerned about Ricky, on this phone call, Sandy would say to Ricky, please come to my apartment and let me take care of you. If you're not feeling well, I'll make you feel better. Just please come to my apartment right now. But Ricky said, no, he did not want to go to Sandy's apartment. He told her instead he was going to walk to a nearby gas station to get a bite to eat. And then afterwards he would give Sandy a call. And so the two of them agreed to this plan. They hung up. But then Ricky did not call Sandy later. A worker at the gas station where Ricky said he was going would later tell authorities that Ricky did come into the gas station and he got a hot dog on that day, the 26th. And then the next day, this same worker said, yep, we saw Ricky again on the 27th. He came in here, he got a bite to eat, and then he left. But after that, Nobody saw Ricky, not his aunt, not his mom, not his girlfriend. He didn't show up in any other emergency rooms in Missouri. He just disappeared. On June 30th, so three days after Ricky was last seen at this gas station, a woman was driving her car 20 miles north of St. Louis on this highway when she looked out into this cornfield that butted up against the highway and she saw kind of in the middle of it was this dark shape that looked totally out of place. And so she was intrigued enough that she actually pulled over on on the road, she got out and began walking into this cornfield to see what this thing was. And when she got up to this thing and saw what it was, she froze in horror and then she screamed, turned around and ran back to her car and she flew to the nearest gas station. She grabbed a payphone and she called 911. When the police arrived at this cornfield, they too walked out towards this dark thing. And then finally they saw what this thing was that had scared this woman. It was a dead person who was lying face down. Their body was very badly decomposed. And in fact, their body was just kind of falling apart. Like the fingers of this person's body had just kind of crumpled off of their hands. 
Now, based on what this person was wearing, they appeared to be male, but there was no way to tell how this person died or really how long they had been dead for. But despite the advanced decomposition, authorities were able to get a good fingerprint and it would turn out that this body belonged to Ricky McCormick. The day after Ricky's body was found, the police would come out and say they were treating his death as a homicide. This area along this highway in this cornfield was actually a fairly common place for murderers to dump their victims. And it was very unlikely that Ricky had gotten there by himself. He didn't have a car. In fact, he didn't even have a driver's license. There was no public transportation that could have brought him to this spot. And if Ricky had decided to walk to this area for some reason, it was a solid 15 miles from where he lived and worked. Also, Ricky's body was way too decomposed relative to when he had last been seen alive, just three days earlier. And so there was a theory that perhaps he was killed somewhere else and then kept indoors in heat and that had accelerated his decomposition and that at some point whoever had killed him had moved his body and dumped it in this cornfield. And so on that first day of the homicide investigation, July 1st, the police put 18 detectives, so a ton of detectives, on this case and they also appealed to the public to come forward if you had any information about what could have happened to Ricky McCormick. But just a day later on July 2nd, the police came out and made an announcement that, you know, after looking at all the evidence and looking at Ricky's body again, it did not appear, in fact, that he had been murdered, but instead he must have died of natural causes. This is a guy that had lung and heart problems and so that is likely what killed him case closed. And so after this announcement, all of the evidence in Ricky's case was bundled up, put into storage, and people just kind of forgot about it. Six months later, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI, got a tip that involved Ricky McCormick. They were working on a case in St. Louis, Missouri, about this major drug dealer who apparently was ordering hits on his rivals, and a confidential informant came forward and told the FBI that this guy, Ricky McCormick, had gotten wrapped up with this major drug dealer but they didn't really know what role Ricky was playing with this drug dealer. It was just kind of a rumor on the street that, you know, Ricky was involved somehow. This did not make any sense to the FBI because they're thinking, why would this big time drug dealer who really was a mover and shaker in St. Louis get involved with this guy, Ricky McCormick, who was obviously deeply mentally ill and borderline homeless? I mean, what role could Ricky play for this drug dealer? But the FBI still did follow up on this tip because it was very credible. And when they spoke to the local police who had investigated Ricky's death, they got Ricky's file, which meant they got all of the evidence. And immediately the FBI realized the local police had overlooked a very strange piece of evidence found in Ricky's pocket. This strange evidence was quickly sent to FBI headquarters in Quantico, Virginia, and it landed on the desk of a forensic analyst named Dan Olson. Dan was relatively new to the FBI, but he was highly disciplined and very methodical. And so when he received this piece of evidence, he got to work right away trying to figure out what it was, you know, what it meant in relationship to Ricky and this drug dealer. And, you know, maybe does it answer the question of how these people are connected? But despite his best efforts and calling in the experts and using every computer program to analyze this evidence, he just could not figure out what it meant. At the same time that Dan was doing this, the big drug dealer who was the target of that big FBI investigation in St. Louis was arrested on gun and drug charges. And so the big case was now over. And suddenly trying to figure out what connection Ricky McCormick had to this drug dealer was kind of irrelevant because the drug dealer was behind bars and Ricky was already dead. And so the FBI kind of put a pause on trying to figure out what this evidence was. And so Dan, even though he was really curious now, he was fully invested in trying to figure out what this thing was, he realized he had to give it up too and move on to something else. And so the strange evidence went back into storage. And once again, everyone just kind of moved on from Ricky McCormick. But Dan never really forgot about this mystifying piece of evidence. It was always in the back of his mind. 
22 years later, Dan Olson had now become very senior at the FBI. He was actually in charge of their cryptanalysis and racketeering unit. Basically, he was in charge of the people at the FBI who specialized in code breaking, meaning they were the people that would pull any sort of secret messages embedded inside of evidence. And so at some point after taking over this unit, Dan pulled out of storage this strange piece of evidence connected to Ricky McCormick. And he said, you know what? I just need to know what this means. I have to figure it out. I've never been able to. It's haunted me ever since. And so Dan went public. He went to the media and he asked the world to take a look at this mystifying piece of evidence and come forward if you have any idea what it means. When Ricky was discovered in that cornfield, the local police quickly emptied his pockets. And in his pants pocket were two documents that contained an incredibly complex cipher or code. It was basically 30 lines on each piece of paper with different symbols and letters and capital letters. I mean, it looked like total gibberish to the untrained eye, but to people like Dan and his code breaking team, these symbols and letters could mean there was a secret message hidden inside of these documents if you could break the code system. But of course, no one could ever break that code. So how in the world does a guy like Ricky, who is basically functionally illiterate and can only write his name, he's clearly mentally ill and he's not really in touch with reality all the time. How does a guy like that come to be in possession of these complex ciphers? And if he didn't write these ciphers, because that's possible, maybe somebody else gave them to Ricky, well, why would anyone who came up with this very complex cipher entrust a guy like Ricky to be the one to carry these things around? I mean, presumably they contain confidential information that's been very carefully hidden inside of the cipher. And so why give it to Ricky? He's such a liability. And also, what happened to Ricky in that cornfield? I mean, we don't even know how he got there. We don't know how he was killed. All we know is that he had these ciphers in his pocket when he was found. And so many people believe, including law enforcement, that the answer to, you know, what happened to Ricky and what was his connection to this drug lord in St. Louis, if any, or, you know, what was he up to, will all be solved if we can just figure out what these two ciphers mean. But as of right now, no one has solved the riddle of what these two ciphers mean. All we know is that Ricky McCormick, a couple of weeks before he died, became increasingly paranoid and was so scared of someone or something that he was likely running into these hospitals just to hide out. But eventually, whoever or whatever Ricky was scared of very likely caught up to him and killed him. But until we crack these ciphers, we very likely will have no idea what actually happened to Ricky McCormick. Today, the FBI has set up a special website where you can look at these two ciphers that Ricky had in his pocket. And if you're able to crack them, because someone's going to eventually, you can tell the FBI through this website and potentially help solve Ricky's murder. To go to this FBI website, click the link in the description below. Dirty feet are strong and built and fly. Het zacht door de velden heen, de wolken dansen in de blauwe lucht. Het wolf roept ons met zijn. On the morning of February 6th, 1821, four young men stood on the deck of a small boat out in the Pacific Ocean. The sun was out, it was beautiful and warm, the water was crystal blue, but none of these four men were paying any attention to their surroundings. Instead, all of them were just standing there in total silence, staring at each other. Finally, one of the four men spoke up. His name was Owen Coffin, and he was 18 years old. And Owen, like the other three men, had grown up on the water. In fact, all four of these men had grown up on the small island called Nantucket, off the coast of Massachusetts, where the main industry there was whaling, which meant sailors like these four men would go out and hunt whales and slaughter them for their oil. 
So from the time Owen and the rest of these men were very little, they were out on the water learning how to sail, and they were also learning the customs of the sea. And there was one custom in particular that Owen wanted to talk about right now with the other three men. So in a very serious and hushed tone, Owen asked the question of the other three men that sailors referred to as the delicate question. And after Owen asked the so-called delicate question, the other three men who were already very serious and just kind of standing there in silence, suddenly their eyes started to go wide and their mouths went to gape. And then again, all of the men just kind of fell into total silence. The only sound they could hear was the splashing of the waves against the side of the boat. The captain of this vessel was a man named George Pollard. He was 28 years old, and he was actually Owen's older cousin. And what George wanted to say to Owen in response to his delicate question was no. But George didn't say that. Instead, he just put his hands up over his mouth and stared kind of incredulously at Owen and the other two men who were also teenagers. Their names were George and Barzillai. And as he stared at these other three men, he realized that their answers to the delicate question was a resounding yes. They knew it had to be a yes. They had to do this. And even though George could totally override them because he was the captain and so technically in charge, he knew in this situation, under this particular custom, he couldn't overrule them. And so, with his hands still over his mouth, George just nodded a yes. Yes, let's go forward with this custom. And so, with a unanimous decision to move forward, Owen slowly reached down and pulled out the ship's logbook from underneath one of the seats behind him. And then he opened up the book and he flipped to the back pages of the logbook, which were totally blank, and he grabbed one of the pieces of paper and he ripped it out of the book. Then, Owen began to rip this piece of paper into strips. First, he ripped three identically long pieces of paper, and he held up all three at the same time to show the others that these are the three that are the same. And each of the three nodded their head. Yes, we see that. And then Owen reached down, he grabbed the paper again, and he ripped a fourth strip out, and this one was dramatically shorter than the other three. And so Owen held up this much shorter piece, and he showed Charles, George, and Barzilai, and again, they all kind of nodded in agreement. Yes, we see, that's the short piece. And so once the whole group was satisfied that they had their four strips, Owen took off his hat, he put all four strips inside, mixed it around, and held out his hat. It was time. The first man to reach into Owen's hat was Owen's older cousin and the captain, George. He reached in, he pulled one of the strips of paper out, closed it in his fist so he had no idea which one it was, and pulled it back and held it close to his chest. And then one by one, each of the other men did the same thing, reaching in, grabbing their strip, not looking at it, and holding it against their chest. And then once all the strips had been taken, at the exact same time, all four men extended their hands into the middle of the circle they were standing in, and they opened their hands, palm up, to reveal which strip they got. And George, Charles, and Barzilai all had the identical long pieces, and Owen, the 18-year-old, the younger cousin of the captain, the one who had ripped up the strips, he had the short strip. And immediately when his older cousin, George, saw this, he yelled out, no, let me take that one. But Owen said, no, this is customary. I want this. And so after a few moments of the men kind of collecting themselves and calming down, Charles then grabbed the logbook again, flipped to the back of it, pulled out another blank page, and he ripped it into strips again, except now he was only ripping them into three strips, two long that were identical and one short. And once again, as he ripped them, he held them up to show the other men to show this was a fair process. Then Charles took off his hat, put the three strips inside, and extended it to George and Barzilai. Owen was not a part of this round. And so George and Barzilai, one by one, reached in, took their strip, held it to their chest, and then Charles, he would take the last strip, he would hold it to his chest, and then once all the men had their pieces, they held their hands out into the middle of their now smaller circle, they opened their hands, palm up, and this time it would be Charles, the man who ripped up this second round, who would discover he had the short strip. And as soon as Charles saw this, he threw it on the ground and he ran to the other side of the boat and began screaming, I can't do this, I can't do it. Meanwhile, Owen, George, and Barzilai didn't even move or flinch. They just stood there waiting for Charles to calm down. 
because they knew he knew this was a very important custom. And once you begin doing it, you can't just stop. Charles would have to come back over and play his role. And so after a few minutes of Charles still kind of calling out that he couldn't do this, he couldn't do this, tears are coming down his face. He finally wiped the tears, he calmed himself down, and he walked back over to the group, who again, they hadn't moved. George, Barzilai, and Owen, they're just standing there waiting to continue this custom. And so as Charles began coming back over, looking ready to continue, George, without even saying anything, reached down and unlatched a door on the side of the boat. He opened it up, he reached in, and he pulled out this long object that was wrapped in canvas. And then he handed this object to Charles. And then once Charles had possession of this object, Owen, the man who had first drawn the short piece of paper, said to the group, now it's time for a moment of silence, even though at this point, none of the men were talking. But still, they formed a tight circle with Charles holding this object and they all bowed their heads and they just stood there in total silence. And then once Owen raised his head, the other three did as well. And Owen, one by one, touched the shoulders of each of the men and reminded them that this had been a fair process. Then, without saying another word, Owen turned away from the group. He walked over to the edge of the boat, looking out over the water. He got down on his knees. He made sure his posture was good, and he looked out over the water. Owen had always loved the ocean, even though his own father had died out at sea. But this particular whaling expedition that Owen had been on, he thought went extremely well, and he was very proud of what they had all accomplished. And Owen was especially proud to be a part of this particular custom. This custom was one that so few people ever took part in, but all sailors knew about it. It was kind of like the forbidden custom. And here he was playing a central role, which really required a lot of strength. And so feeling very proud of himself, Owen, after looking out over the water for a few more moments, he bent down and put his chin on the edge of the boat, which signaled to Charles, it was time. And then once Charles saw that Owen was in position, he stepped away from George and Barzilai and walked over to Owen, carrying this object wrapped in canvas. And then once he was right behind Owen, without saying a word to him, he unwrapped the object and it was a rifle. And once the rifle was uncovered, placed the barrel against the back of Owen's head, and then he fired a shot. And instantly, Owen slumped to the ground, dead, and Charles kind of staggered back and fell on the deck and let out the strangled scream. He couldn't believe what he had just done, but he knew there was no other choice. Once they decided to do this sacred custom, they had to take it to the end. And so George, who had just witnessed the execution of his younger cousin, was deeply troubled and pained, but he too knew they had to bring bring this custom to the finish line, which meant it was George's turn to step forward and play his part. And so George walked up to his now dead younger cousin and George pulled out a serrated knife and cut off Owen's head. And then once Owen's head was removed, he placed it on the deck so Owen's face was looking away from the other men, like he couldn't see what they were going to do. And then once the head was in place, George went back to Owen's body and began cutting him open and pulling his organs out and handing them to Charles and Barzilai. George also began cutting off long strips of Owen's flesh, creating sort of like fillets. And then even though there was a spot on the boat to have a fire, the three men decided they just could not wait. And before long, the only sound that could be heard on board this little boat floating out at sea on the Pacific Ocean was the sound of Charles, George, and Barzilai tearing into Owen's raw flesh with their teeth, turning their beards bright red with his blood. The delicate question that Owen asked the other men at the beginning of this story was one of the most feared questions amongst sailors. And it was only asked if there was a shipwreck or some sort of emergency that happened out at sea, which meant the group had almost no chance of survival. Only in those circumstances was the delicate question appropriate. And what it was, was do we draw lots to determine which one of us dies so the other can eat them in order to have a better chance at survival. And so during that first round, when Owen had drawn the short strip of paper, that determined he would be the one who was murdered and eaten. And then in the second round, when Charles drew the short strip of paper, that meant he would be the one to kill Owen. 
On February 6th, 1821, the day that Owen posed the delicate question, he and the other three men had been lost at sea for the past three months after a whale had struck the side of their whaling boat and left them adrift with almost no food and no water. There had been other men on board the Essex who had died from starvation and exposure and their bodies had been consumed by the surviving sailors until on February 6th, they were down to just these four men and no more bodies to eat, which is why they decided it was time. They had to ask the delicate question. 17 days after Owen sacrificed himself so the others could eat him, another boat happened to drift past the stranded Essex boat, which now only contained Charles and George. Barzillai had died of starvation five days after they killed Owen, and Barzillai had been eaten by George and Charles as well. And as this other ship passed by the Essex and they looked on board, all they saw were skeletons of the men that had died and been eaten, and Charles and George were on opposite ends of the boat, curled up in a ball, chewing on human finger bones, trying to get the last bits of flesh off. And their bodies were totally emaciated, their hair and their beards were wild, they looked totally feral. And then when this boat actually came up alongside the Essex and boarded to rescue Charles and George, Charles and George looked terrified. It was like they had totally lost their grip on reality. They had been lost at sea for 94 days and had consumed all of their friends. And so it makes sense they might go kind of crazy. But after this crew was able to get Charles and George fed and get them water and cleaned up, they kind of regained their composure and their sanity, and they were very thankful and happy to be alive. The story of what happened to the crew of the Essex quickly spread all around the world. And in fact, it served as inspiration for Herman Melville to write his classic American novel, Moby Dick.